we find people serving the Lord in very inconspicuous places in the Bible and even in the world today. But do you remember Moses? He was born a Hebrew, but he was raised in Pharaoh's house. And after killing an abusive Egyptian slave driver, Moses escapes the death penalty by running to the wilderness. But yet Moses was a servant of God. Nehemiah, a cupbearer to the king of Persia, when he gets some disturbing news, his countrymen back in Jerusalem and, and are, they're suffering terribly. The, the walls are torn down in the city. The city's in shambles. And Nehemiah then gets the go-ahead, the permission from King Artaxerxes to rebuild the city walls and gates and take off for Jerusalem. What about David? All of us have heard about him. Yes, he's the shepherd boy who killed Goliath the giant. He's the war hero, the war hero king who delivered Israel from her enemies and established Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He's the one that had Uriah killed, however, so he could have his wife. We don't have time to, to look at many others, but just to mention a few, there was Ruth. What about Rahab? There were fishermen. There were tent makers. There were scribes. Though there were those who persecuted Christians, we find all these kinds of people that served the Lord, although they were serving in inconspicuous places and maybe in places that we would not want to find ourselves today. We find people that change their lives, that repent. And they're not the same people that they were. And they become very faithful to God, a wonderful servant, a great servant. We should not find it difficult today when we look at Bible characters to, to find those today who love and serve the Lord, who come from all walks of life. You may know of, I know of some of the following. I, I've, I know of or heard of drug addicts that have changed their lives around. Serving God, alcoholics. I know of one that's shared the gospel with thousands of people, and there's no telling how many hundreds and hundreds of people that have obeyed the gospel. What about Satan worshipers and atheists? and murderers. And the list can go on and on. People can change. The gospel of Christ changes people. We need to realize how sinful we really are in the eyes of God, that our own righteousness is nothing but filthy rags, and we need the righteousness of Christ credited, accounted unto us. It doesn't matter who you are today. God loves you. God loves me. And he wants all of us to be part of his family. And he will use us. In John 3, 16, it states, for God so loved the world that he gave. He sacrificed in giving his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says that God wants all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Peter wrote, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
repentance is possible in our lives, to have a different mind set, a change of mind, to do the will of God in our lives, rather than following our own flesh, our own feelings, our own will. It's not within man to direct his steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. God's ways are different than our ways. His ways are much higher, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. Obadiah is the individual that we're going to be studying in Elijah's faith series, part five, today. For you see, Obadiah is a individual in 1 Kings chapter 18 that is a faithful servant of God, as we're going to notice in the first six verses. In verses 7 through 14, however, he has an objection towards the command that is given to Obadiah through Elijah. Then we're going to have the obedience of Obadiah in verses 15 and 16. I'm glad you're with us today as we are studying from God's Word, 1 Kings chapter 8, and we will be looking at this particular chapter. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. In 1 Kings chapter 18. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, into all the fountains of water, and into all the brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one by Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered him and said, I am. Go tell thy lord. Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned? that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, whether my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation, that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it came to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord. Behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. The first thing I want us to notice today is that Obadiah is in an inconspicuous place serving the Lord. He is unlikely servant of the Lord. Notice verse 3. He is in Ahab's house, being the governor. Remember God's assessment of the king and his wife back in chapter 16, verse 30. He said that he did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him, referring to King Ahab. In verse 33, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. We need to remember at this period of time, 
the whole nation, <clears throat> with but a few exceptions, abandoned itself to the dissipated worship of Phoenician gods. The true worship of God had been abandoned. Altars that were built for God were overthrown, <clears throat> excuse me, that their fathers had built. And there was a determined effort to stamp out her prophets. What does governor mean being a governor of a house? It means above, over, upon, had the charge of, concerning for. Listen to some other translations of this particular verse in verse 3. It refers to him as being the steward in the LXC. The NAS says that Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. The NLT says, so Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. So here's a man who is entrusted with the things that belong to Ahab and Jezebel. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 5, remember concerning Joseph, how that it came to pass from the time he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had. So something very similar to Joseph. Why would an ungodly king want a God-fearing man, a godly man, be in charge of his house? I've got another question to answer that question. Who makes the best citizens? Who makes the best workers? I'm going to tell you who it ought to be. It ought to be Christians, children of God. And I want you to think about yourself, and I need to think about myself also. Are we working as if we are working for the Lord? In Colossians chapter 3, I want you to listen to the first three verses as he writes to these Christians in Colossae. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now keep that in mind. <clears throat> Going to pick up reading in verses 22 through 25 of chapter 3. Bond servants, we could say workers today, obey in all things your masters, your bosses, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. There is no respect of person. So the Christian, the child of God, the follower of God, ought to be one whom another person can trust. He ought to be a faithful worker. And as wicked as Ahab was, I imagine that he preferred Obadiah to be the governor of his house. Think about it. Who was there? Well, Jezebel was there. He'd want someone in there that he could trust with Jezebel. He would want someone in there that he could trust with the things in his house, the operation of his house, the house goods, servants, and so forth. We think of other people in similar circumstances in the Bible. What about Daniel in the house of the kings of Babylon? What about Christians that were in the household of Caesar in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22? All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. It was not uncommon for Christians to be in the homes of kings. 
and queens, for they knew the type of people they were. They knew that God-fearing people, that people lived for God, would be honest, would be trustworthy, would be dependable. The characteristics of a godly Christian man would be highly sought after for being able to trust them. Think about all of the immorality that surrounded Obadiah at this time. Would we have ever thought of finding a servant of the Lord God in such surroundings? How could such a one retain his godliness in a cesspool of corruption and a hotbed of idolatry and immorality at a particular time when Jezebel were murdering prophets? The answer is found in number two this evening. Secondly, he feared the Lord greatly in verse three. And he had called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. And the text specifically states, now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. It's found again in verse 12, but thy servant fear the Lord. Remember, we're talking about the third ruler in the kingdom. You'd have Ahab, you'd have Jezebel, and now Obadiah. He feared the Lord greatly, even though surrounded by Baal worshipers. I come to the conclusion as I read chapter 18, he did not bow down to Baal. He did not give a knee to Baal. He bowed down before the Lord and he risked his life as a result of his devotion and his commitment to the Lord God. As we turn to the New Testament, I want you to listen to what Paul said about the saints in Rome to whom he addressed the book of Romans. In chapter 1, verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Look at this. They were the talk of the town. People throughout the world admired them, respected them. They were the pattern for the whole world. And where were they? In the Roman city of Rome. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, he writes, So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. You see, those guards that were guarding Paul, without a doubt, heard many lessons concerning Jesus Christ. No doubt heard many songs of praises and hymns and spiritual songs as they stood there by Paul. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, it says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. There's no doubt that there were many, many people who became Christians that served in Caesar's household, possibly even some of Caesar's family in the Praetorian Guard. You may be wondering why mention these things in Rome in relationship to Obadiah. You see, Rome at this time was one of the worst cities in the world. The palace was occupied by Nero, a murderer, a family, a, one of the most meanest persons on earth at this time. He was a persecutor. Oh, and I want you to think about it. Under Nero's roof, <clears throat> there were faithful men and women of God. And so God gives us two examples, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, where people can live for God in the most adverse circumstances and ungodliness in their surroundings. If men could be saints 
in Nero's household and in Ahab's household, they can be saints anywhere. What do we do? Normally, we pray for God to take us out of those circumstances instead of a, asking God to help us to teach and to be a great influence upon these people. Could it be that God is opening a door for us to influence these people? Many claim they can't serve God because of their, the adverse circumstances that they find themselves in. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus in John 17, verses 14 through 16. Jesus never prayed for God to remove the disciples out of the world. Listen to his words. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of this world. They will do us the same, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Notice what he said. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Yes, the example of Obadiah, the example of those saints, the example of the Praetorian Guard, gives us confidence and assurance we can also live for God in an ungodly world. And they faced great persecution, which we haven't faced in our lives as they did. Did you realize the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Twice in this text, it's mentioned that Obadiah feared the Lord. In Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. In Job 28, verse 28, and unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 states, The fear of of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Yes, I have found some that do despise it. The fear of the Lord was not enough. It needs to lead to understanding. In what way? To do his commandments. To depart from evil, which we would say that it would be repentance if we've been committing evil in our lives. In Acts chapter 26, verse 20, it says that they should repent and turn to God and to do works meet for repentance. Can others see works of repentance in our lives today? Can they see that we are a different person today than what we were 20 years ago, five years ago? Obadiah stated to Elijah in 1 Kings 18, verse 12, I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, Paul writes to Timothy, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. If we had parents that taught us about God, that took us to Bible classes and to worship services, we need to praise God for those kind of parents. It is very important for parents to teach their children these things. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Remember, this is a proverb. It doesn't happen all the time. But I want you to listen to some other translations. It says, teach your children to choose the right path. And when they are older, they will remain upon it. Another says, train children in the right way. 
Notice it says, give instruction to a youth about his way. In Ephesians 6, 4, fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It is the father's responsibility in the family to make sure the children in the family are brought up properly. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. What did fear of the Lord prompt Obadiah to do? He hid 100 of the Lord's prophets when Jezebel was trying to slay them. In 1 Kings 18, 4, For it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. In verse 13, he mentions this to Elijah again. Was it not told, my Lord, that what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I, hindered, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? Through the sin of Jeroboam, the priests and Levites went into Judah and to supply their lack in Ephraim, prophet colleges were established and the students in these particular colleges were called the sons of the prophets. And can you imagine the hatred that Jezebel and Ahab had towards these men that taught and these students? Remember now, Elijah's been hid three and a half years at the river Kareth and at Zarephath's, the Zarephath's widow's house. Persecution is taking place. And what does Obadiah do? He hides the prophets in two different groups for protection from Jezebel and Ahab. He did this knowing what would happen if he was caught. He did not fear the wrath of the king. We need men and women who will stand up and be counted on the Lord's side. Even when it is not politically correct. You remember when Peter and the apostles were told not to speak in the name of Jesus? Not to speak any more about Jesus whatsoever? And he told them, would it be right in the sight of God, judge ye. And you go back and read chapter 5, verse 28 and 29 in the book of Acts and verses 40 through 42 and also chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, look at the attitude of Moses. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with people of God then enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. Obadiah knew the power of God. He realized what God was able to do. And in verse 12, he knew the Lord was able to move Elijah away to a place he could not be found. Notice verse 12. And it shall come to pass, and this is as he's talking to Ahab, I'm sorry, when he's talking to Elijah, when Elijah wants him to go tell Ahab to come to Elijah, he says, it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Yes, Obadiah knew the power of God. And we see that in verse 12. In Luke chapter 5, verse 23, Jesus said, what is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk? In Matthew 10, 28, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body 
in hell. The next thing I want us to see is, is that Obadiah had respect for Elijah, a prophet of the Lord. In verse 7, he knew Elijah, and as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him. How did he know Elijah? We do not know. I want you to think about how Elijah probably looked. He's been hiding three and a half years. 2 Kings 1.8 says he was a hairy man and girt about his loins. Uh, John the Baptist was known for wearing camel hair and a leather belt around his waist in Matthew 3, 4, and many people think that <clears throat> that uh, resembled the way that Elijah was dressed. Evidently, this kind of clothing was unusual. Uh, it wasn't the traditional type of attire that you would find a man dressed in, and it could it be that through this attire being unusual that Elijah is recognizable to Obadiah? That's possible. Could it have been that they had previously had contact with one another? That's possible. Uh, was Obadiah present when uh, Ahab warned the king of the coming famine? That's possible. Had he seen Elijah talking to Jezebel and Ahab and maybe not even in his presence? And that's possible. Had he seen him around somewhere else? That's possible. We just don't know. The text doesn't say. But Obadiah recognized him, and he fell on his face before Elijah, showing respect and honor. This was a tradition, showing respect during this period of time. And people in the Far East have done that for years. I you think of the curtsy of a woman. I can remember how men used to bow when introduced to a woman or kiss her hand. I used, I remember when, I, I remember that watching it on TV, I'll put it that way. I do remember when men used to get up out of their seats to let a woman, women, a woman sit down. Look at the respect Obadiah has for Elijah. He bows down, falls on his face. Excuse me, refers to Elijah as being Lord. In her text, it seems if he is asking Elijah if Elijah is his Lord, how can that be? He already knows who Elijah was. Obadiah greatly feared the Lord, which would have prevented him calling a man a Lord as on equality with the Lord God. He's just showing respect. And Obadiah, the, the next thing is that Obadiah was human. As you look at verses 8 through 15, we're not going to take time to read that as we've read it already. But he, in essence, he tells Elijah, I'm afraid of Ahab and Jezebel. And am I, I'm afraid that when I go back and tell him that you want to see him and he comes and he tries to find you and doesn't find you, I am going to be killed. What wrong have I done in verse 9? Look at verse 14. Is this the result of my devotion towards you? You're giving me the death sentence. In other words, is what uh, Obadiah is saying to Elijah. Obadiah is having a, a difficult time thinking about how he has served the Lord and, and how the Lord was sending him to die. Don't you know, Elijah, haven't you heard what I've done with the prophets in the past? And I've served the Lord from my youth. I've done so much good. You don't understand how valuable I am in the Lord's cause. Is it possible he was desiring for Elijah to change his mind? Absolutely. More than that, is it possible that he's wanting the Lord to tell Elijah something different so we not have to go to his master Ahab? Absolutely. Elijah reaffirms to him that he will not leave, verse 15. And so Obadiah obeys. He leaves and he goes tells Ahab that Elijah desires to see him. Servants of the Lord can be found all over the world in all kinds of circumstances 
in inconspicuous places who remain faithful. We should not allow our circumstances in life, our surroundings, keep us from being faithful to God. We can't separate ourselves from living in this world, but we can keep the world from living in us. And we need to remember the conclusion that Solomon made in his life after he searched the world over for the meaning of life and happiness. And this is his conclusion. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And I want to go back to a verse we read a few minutes ago. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And close out with a thought or two from this verse. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And we look at this verse as being a kind of a, a negative way. He says, don't be afraid of those who kill the body. Be afraid of the one who can throw both soul and body in hell. But I want us to look at this from a different perspective because he's preparing his followers to go out into the world and share the good news with people. And he wants them to realize the good news is this. God will not throw your body and soul in hell if you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? That's a good news. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the good news. And Jesus is serving us as our mediator between man and God. He is serving us today. Is Jesus your mediator? Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Savior? Let's fear God and keep his commandments. Let's remember Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, this week and meditate upon it on a regular basis. And I want to thank you so much for watching the Prairie Plains Church of Christ Bible Study for September the 23rd.